Um, I um, echo Alden in welcoming you all to the program. And um, it's always fun to have people show up online, but like you said, better safe than sorry tonight. So anyway, so thank you for being here. Um, we are the Charlotte Wildlife Stewards, uh, the chapter, we are a chapter of the North Carolina Wildlife Federation. We have, I believe, 20 chapters across the state and growing. So if you're not, you know, the folks that are online, if you are somewhere else in North Carolina, go to the North Carolina Wildlife Federation website um, and you can find a chapter in your area. I would encourage you to look them up and get involved. So our mission is to create, protect, and preserve wildlife habitat through education, engagement, and enjoyment. Um, our mascot is the beautiful barred owl. Um, I'm sure many of you in Charlotte are familiar with their, with their beautiful call. They're, I believe it's baiting season, so you should be hearing even more of it. Um, one of the things I wanted to mention um, for, in, in the cold weather, uh, water is probably the most important thing you can provide for wildlife, not just for birds, but for, for all wildlife. They all need water. Uh, if you have a bird bath, I would encourage you to invest in uh, one of the de-icers. These are devices, they're electrical. You, you put it in the water and um, at 35 degrees, it kicks on and it just keeps it from freezing. And uh, birds especially need that, not just for drinking. Um, it is important to stay hydrated in the cold weather, but they also need to keep their feathers in prime condition um, for flying when it's cold. And of course, you'll get some other little critters that will enjoy that water. So this past weekend, uh, we had a wonderful volunteer event. We planted 60 trees. Uh, we had, uh, and I forget how many, 40, we had 40 volunteers planted 60 trees in collaboration with Charlotte Stormwater Services. This is in a former, uh, there used to be houses on this property, but it was a floodplain. So now there are gonna be trees, lots of habitat for wildlife and a lot of ecological services from these trees. It was a really great event. We have volunteer opportunities off and on during the year. I think, I know through May, we probably have two or three events every month. So keep up with our newsletter. If, if you're not signed up, go to our website. You can sign up there. Also follow on our website. We keep that updated and we're all, of course on Facebook and Instagram. We'd love to have you come out and join us for an event. Um, are you a member of our chapter? Uh, so you can, uh, sorry. So when you join us, you're, you're technically joining the North Carolina Wildlife Federation and you would designate Charlotte Wildlife Stewards as your chapter or if you're in one of the areas, other areas of the state, whatever that local chapter is, you would choose that one. And it's it's a great way um, to start networking with other folks that are that love wildlife. Uh, you do get the wildlife wire and action alerts from Na North Carolina Wildlife Federation. So that will have lots of educational opportunities and volunteer op opportunities. Um, it's $25 a year to join, which isn't that much. And that $25 goes to the chapter, which helps each chapter in provide, you know, so they can do their programs and projects and events. So a couple of things we have coming up in February at Latin Nature Preserve, we'll be participating in their Fairy House Festival. We'll have some hands-on activity there for the kids. It's a it's a lot of fun. Uh, people come out, it doesn't matter what the weather is, they come and they have a great time. The other thing is we will be having a trash cleanup. Uh, we have adopted a section of Tyvola Road and this will be on February 25th. It's in the afternoon from two to four. And there is a sign up. Um, if there isn't already a sign up, there will be a sign up on our website if you would like to help with that. We will, uh, getting back to the Fairy House Festival, we will need a few volunteers to help us with that. There will be, we're going to do two or three shifts, and there will be, a, you know, a, a chapter leader with each shift, but it would be nice to have some volunteers to help the kids with their hands-on project. And then um, uh, our next upcoming program, so tonight we have the program on coyotes, um, and then February 13th, Hannah Partridge, who's a PhD student, has been studying the nesting habits of the vultures in our city. She'll be um, talking to us about them. 
And then Sarah Gagne is a professor at UNCC, and she has written this book called Nature at Your Door, and she will be sharing her insights with us in March. And as um, Alden mentioned, um, the, for our inline program, we were going to have a raffle. Well, we're not in line, so we're trying something brand new. So you'll have to bear with us. Um, we're going to do the raffle online. So our uh, one of our chapter leaders, Brittany, has found a website that uh, we can do this with. So I'm going to go ahead and unshare my screen so Brittany can share hers. Thanks, Donna. Um, hi, everybody. Um, yeah, so today we are so excited to have you guys here and we're raffling off Coyote's Wild Home, um, a beautiful book by Barbara King Solver. And I believe is that her daughter, Lily King Solver. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, so let me go ahead and share my screen. Now I will say I have everyone who registered for this event, but um, I know circumstances have changed today. So we'll do this. If we get someone who's not here, we'll go again until we get someone who is here. Um, if your name pops up, will you please reply in the chat so that we know that you're here? I'll, I'll scan um, the members as well so that we can see um, if you're here. But let's kick it off. You have to laugh at the little noises it makes. <laughs> Catherine. Let's see. Catherine, if you're here, will you reply to us? Let's see. Let me check the chat. I don't see Catherine. I don't either. Okay, let's go again. Okay, let's spin again. I'm searching the attendees too. So Okay, great. Me too. Thanks, Alden. Jody. Looks like Jody's here. Jody, are you J here? Jody, you can talk. Are you here? I am here, yes. Yay, congratulations. All right. Thank you. <laughs> Jody, we'll get with you for the raffle prize. Um, I've got your contact information, so we'll reach out so you can uh, get this raffle prize. Awesome. Thank you so much. Congrats. You're welcome. All right, Donna, back over to you. Okay. Okay. Okay, there we are. Okay. Next thing. Okay. So um y'all are here because you want to learn about coyotes. Um they are here and they're quite a controversial animal. Um on our several on our post on Facebook, we've had several comments. Some of them are positive and then some of them were not quite so positive. And I hope some of those folks are here. Um so that they can learn about them. Maybe they'll develop a different appreciation for them. Um, I don't know. I didn't know there are pluses and cons and Rupert will talk with us about them. Um, so um, I would like to turn this over to Rupert. I will, um, let me just introduce him to you. Um, Rupert Medford is the District 6 Wildlife Biologist with the North Carolina Wildlife Resources Commission. His position uh, covers 10 countings in the Southern Piedmont and he focuses on supporting private landowners with technical guidance and surveilling for wildlife diseases. He earned his bachelor's degree in fisheries and wildlife sciences from North Carolina State University in 2006. His current work includes sampling for chronic wasting disease, game population management, and technical, technical guidance to the citizens of District 6. He is married to his wife, Allison, who is also a wildlife biologist. They have three children. He's passionate about serving as the pastor at his local church, working in his family's bee yard and honey operation, and hunting. So, okay, I'm going to stop sharing my screen, Rupert, and turn it over to you. All right. Start here in just a second. I think I'm showing it now. Can somebody give me an affirmative on that? Looks like it. Yeah, you just pulled it up. Yep. All right. Well, I want to thank you guys for having me. And um, we're going to talk about coyotes. And um, for those of you that don't know, I was supposed to do this last year. And uh, so I had my program ready. 
And um, I, had, I had to go back. I, of course, agreed to do it again at the earliest convenience. And um, I, I went back and looked at my prompt, and um, it's broad. And when, when you start talking about um, even, even just the life history of an animal, um, you can't dig into every facet of it. So I, I just want to admit to you that we're hitting the high spots here tonight. Uh, but I think what you'll come away from this with is realizing that um, coyotes are pretty incredible animals. Um, I, I will agree that there are varied opinions on them. Uh, they seem to be one particular species of wildlife that, that are easy to hate. Um, on the other end of that spectrum, um, many folks, that they have a great love for them, looking at them almost as tiny wolves. And uh, so let's talk a little bit about coyotes, and in particular in North Carolina. Um, so I, ha I have to cover, I know everyone here knows what a coyote is, um, but I want to address a few things just so that we're all starting from the same page, because there are a lot of common misconceptions. Uh, we'll talk about how they got here, and then generally um, the perceptions that people have and the issues um, that folks deal with whether it's in urban spaces or even some of the more rural ones. Um, when, we, when we describe coyotes, uh, we, we should always think of them as a small canid. Now, I hear from folks all the time, and they, they'll say things like, it had to be 80 pounds or it was a 100-pound coyote. But the fact is, uh, they just don't get that big. Um, we do talk to a lot of trappers, and even the most avid trappers will tell you that a 50 pound coyote is extraordinarily rare. Um, as a general rule, they're 30 pounds. Um, certainly some, some are bigger, many are smaller, but a good average is that they are 30 pounds. I, I will admit that they look bigger. In fact, most mammals do uh, when they've got their winter coat in particular, gives them a lot more volume, um, but they're really not very big animals and, and their prey selection reflects their size. Uh, you'll see one of my bullet points here. Um, it says that they have a short tail. And one reason I point that out is so, some people have an exceptional eye when they look at wildlife and they can immediately tell, even at great distances, if they're looking at, say, a fox or a coyote. But that's one of the clues that you can use, even if you just catch a glimpse of the animal. Um, a coyote, when it's standing straight up, if its tail is drooping straight down, it will not touch the ground, whereas a fox's tail will. So usually it is held um, behind the body, almost poised off the ground. They come in lots of different colors. Uh, the vast majority, I'd say well over 90%, are some type of grizzled gray. Um, but we've seen reds and blondes and um, various different shades of black as well. And all of those occur right here in North Carolina. I'm going to show you a couple range maps, well, several, actually. Um, but this one that is, is really zoomed out, it, it shows their historic range, so where they were believed to occur uh, pre-European settlement. And you can see it's mostly uh, the Midwest states. Um, they reached fairly far north and south, um, but seemed to be confined to the center of the United States. And that changed. It, uh, it changed as... Uh, Europeans settled the continent, and they were able to spread. Of course, you can see the light shading, um, and you'll see that they basically occupy most of the continent now. Um, and I say, you know, diet, yes. Uh, this is just one graph from one particular diet study. There have been lots of diet studies. And if I could summarize all diet studies for coyotes, um, I think it would say that they eat what's available. Um, even here in District 6, the habitat types in the 10 County area that I work in, um, they're varied. And I think that you would find that the diets of coyotes are varied according to the foods that are most common where they live. Um, we'll refer to a Fort Bragg study that was conducted by uh, Dr. Mormon at NC State. I don't remember his student's name, um, but they found, for example, that trash made up about 10 percent of a coyote's diet. And in that particular case on Fort Bragg where soldiers are eating MREs, um, there just happened to be a lot of it on the landscape. Here in this example, you'll see that deer is an important prey item. Rodents um, follow closely after that. And lagomorph, that would be rabbits. And, and you, you see that it's varied. And at certain times of year, they eat a lot of plant material. Um, coyotes breed, well, they're, they're breeding starting about now. 
and they'll do that through March and they'll give litters or they'll have litters of, of pups um, about two months after that. Uh, the litter size varies according to how healthy the female is. In fact, this, uh, this picture that you see in the background is a trail camera picture that I took. Uh, well, I say I took it. I put the camera up. This is in the Mallard Creek area. And uh, this particular coyote um, had this litter of pups under an outbuilding in a very densely populated area. And the folks that owned the house, they had seen her a time or two. And um, just out of kind of curiosity more than anything, um, I put the camera up. Uh, my main my main objective was to see what I could get pictures of her bringing back to the den. Um, and I, I was aware at this point in my career that they ate a lot of cats. And I, I hoped I would get a picture of that, but she never brought a single prey item back um, in her mouth. She brought all of it back in her stomach, so none of it was uh, easily identifiable. Um, here's another map showing the same basic thing. It's a little bit more conservative in the range. Um, but what we're going to uh, transition into is North Carolina's settlement of coyotes. And so you can see there that their historic range, and I'll toggle back, um, and that's a takeover right there. And it's really impressive if you think about it from um, the species perspective. Look at the diversity of habitat types. I mean, from deserts to tundra, um, from the harsh far north climate all the way down to um, tropical. It's an amazing animal, um, and they can live virtually anywhere. In fact, coyotes are a true generalist. Um, and one of the things that makes them do so well is that they thrive with human ecology. So wherever people are um, and wherever people are manipulating the landscape, there are going to be coyotes. Um, this is, and I, I've got to give credit to Colleen Altenbuttle. She is our state's fur bear biologist. And um, I think she's the one that put these, this series of slides together that shows um, the coyotes occupying North Carolina. And before 1983, in fact, you look at some of those dates, um, some of them are very old. And it is true. Many of you may have heard that um, long ago that some fox hunters brought coyotes in to their private pens. And they had coyotes for sport, and some of those coyotes were believed to have escaped, and that does seem to be the case. Um, but even if you look at over the next couple of years, you will see that coyotes were spotted in the wild. Um, and this is 83 through 85. Um, and shortly after that, we have in 1988 several more counties. And then in 1990, you can see the state beginning to fill in at least. Uh, as far as east to west, and by 1996, um, it's mostly occupied. And certainly, I think you can say by 2000, coyotes were well established. And even uh, by 2010, we could fill in um, the outer banks there as well. Um, I guess I kind of gave this slide away, and I had to put this in here. We hear many times from constituents, uh, and I, I've had people accuse me. Um, despite the fact that coyotes have been here as, as long as I've been alive, um, they'll say those coyotes that you guys brought in. And I, I will admit that as wildlife managers, um, and, and it's not just my predecessors, biologists in our day and age, we do make mistakes. Um, but coyotes are not one that we can take credit for. Uh, we can take credit for some things like Canada geese or resident Canada geese anyway. The Wildlife Commission did that. Um, but we did not stock coyotes. Um, I already mentioned that fox hunters had brought some of them in, but the fact is they were coming. Um, they were able, as Europeans settled towns and built roads, they were able to hopscotch and, as you saw, colonize the entire country. Um, <clears throat> this is, I'd mentioned a Fort Bragg study. And if you look at um, the little core area, it's marked by blue lines and a red outline up there. Um, in Moore and Hoke County in particular. And this was the study site. Um, in fact, the, the project that was done was, I believe, funded by the DOD. And so the NC State researchers were able to collar a number of coyotes. And this is just one particular coyote that was collared. And um, I believe this was a sub-adult female. It is. You can see it in the bottom right screen there. And uh, so she was collared right here on Fort Bragg, or Fort Liberty now, as they call it. 
And when she went to disperse, she dropped south and she dropped into South Carolina and she trickled on over into Newberry uh, County, South Carolina, kept venturing west, made it into Anderson County, got almost to Georgia, and I can only assume met a coyote that was coming back uh, from Georgia and let her know that it was nothing but a recovering penal colony, that there was nothing there but peaches and leeches. And so she went back to the place that she liked best right here in Newberry County. And uh, I apologize to all the folks from Georgia. Um, but anyway, this just shows the outstanding. It's, this is incredible. Uh, I mean, in fact, we knew coyotes uh, dispersed long distances. But when I first saw um, these results from this study, I, I was astounded. This is an incredible distance. Um, and you can imagine the number of hard surface roads, um, yards, pastures, the dangers that were encountered. And yet this coyote dispersed this incredible distance. Um, here's another one. It was also a young female and um, also leaving Fort Bragg, went north and settled in the northern coastal plain of Virginia. And so just uh, shows their incredible ability for dispersal. This becomes an important facet of their biology when you be begin considering things like extermination, which we hear people mention from time to time. And I think that if you keep in mind, and by the way, this is not the norm. These are certainly the exceptional dispersers, um, but it does showcase their ability to find a place where they can fit in, a place where there is a, a void in the local coyote uh, population and fall in. Um, I always like to, when we start thinking about coyotes and why they do what they do and where they go, I mean, part of it has to do with population dynamics. And there have been some studies done with, um, in particular, GPS collaring um, coyotes. But as far as how many there are in the state, let me just go ahead and admit that we don't really know. Um, we have some, um, we have some data that gives us uh, an index or, or trend data. Um, but as far as saying how many are in each county, it's, it's really impossible. And I, and I hope that y'all will grant that when we start looking at an entire county even. And we're working with something much bigger than a county. It's almost impossible to know um, exactly how many are in or even, even have a decent estimate. Um, we have formulas deriving estimates from harvest, but even then um, they have pretty wide confidence intervals. So this right here, this graph that you're looking at on your screen, um, you'll notice that there are bars and that there's also a line. The bars are hunter harvest estimates of coyotes, um, and the line is trapper harvest. And so one thing you'll notice is that, by the way, there's, there's just not many trappers. Um, there's not a lot of people that do fur trapping these days. The folks that do it do it mostly for wildlife management, um, not for fur. Um, and so those numbers are pretty small. If you look at the hunter numbers, you see that, and by the way, the graph's old. It's, uh, it goes to 2015. Uh, I did look up the numbers uh, just this evening. And since that time, these estimates are basically unchanged. They hover around 30,000. And so um, based on our hunter harvest survey, we think that there's, uh, and there's some years where it gets up as high as 50,000 or 55,000. But most years, it's somewhere between 30 and 40,000. Um, coyotes that hunters harvest every year. Um, many of them are taken by deer hunters. They're kind of incidental uh, harvest, kind of take, done opportunistically. Um, but we have more and more dedicated coyote hunters, um, folks that have equipment just for that, that use calls, many of them that go out at night. Um, but if you look at the numbers, and by the way, basically, it's, it's, a, it's even now still a slightly increasing trend um, since about 2000. And 15, um, a sustainable somewhere in the 30,000s, you could say that they're well established, not going anywhere and not succumbing to any type of hunting or trapping uh, or disease or other mortality pressure. Um, I mentioned earlier that trappers don't take many overall, but trappers are much more efficient. Um, this is a look at coyotes um, per method. And so the, the collar bars. Uh, the light gray, that's the number of coyotes trapped per trapper versus down low um, coyotes taken per hunter. 
All right, I'm going to talk a little bit about, um, well, I, I mentioned the hunter harvest estimates from uh, 2014 on up until now, 30,000 to 55,000. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go ahead and transition into some wildlife interactions. And just as I mentioned earlier, that what a coyote eats depends on exactly where it's situated. In other words, it's specific to its habitat. Um, and so I'm speaking here in generalities. We looked at that diet study um, and we saw that white-tailed deer um, were an important part of their diet. Let's also realize that in North Carolina, deer hunters um, harvest over 100,000 deer per year, which means that there are lots of deer carcasses on the landscape. So just because something shows up in the diet studies a whole lot uh, doesn't necessarily mean that that's a significant prey item. It could be from scavenging that we're seeing that. I haven't said that. Um, there have been a number of studies. And in fact, there was uh, oh, a period of about five or 10 years there where there were um, there were a multitude of studies looking at the fates of newborn white-tailed deer fawns. And what researchers discovered is that fawn predation rates, in particular in the South, were quite high. Um, there, was a, there was a wide range. And some states in the, mid, <clears throat> excuse me, in the Midwest had fairly low predation rates, um, maybe in the 20 percentile. And then in places like North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia, um, 60 even 70 percent of fawns in some of those studies um, were being predated um, and most of the, the the most common predator was a coyote uh, we have uh, a survey that we give out to hunters and this particular survey uh, we ask them to write down what they see when they're hunting and so they'll record the number of adult does the number of fawns antlered bucks and, and even other animals that that they're not specifically hunting and we can get an idea of trends and so we have a pretty good idea of how many fawns there are per doe. And in fact, you could Google that map. It's, it's online. It's on our website if you go to our deer management tab. Um, but what you'll find is that a doe, generally speaking, and it's on a county by county basis. That's how we have it organized. There are about uh, 0.4 fawns per doe in much of my work area, for example. And so it does seem that much of that research that says, um, that around 60% of the fawns are being predated, it fits. Um, now, some of that research was done in the Sand Hills region. I'm, and again, I'm speaking in particular of Fort Bragg. And I, I was astounded at the numbers. And I was thinking, well, if 63% if of fawns are being, are being lost to predation, how is it that we have such wonderful high deer populations? And I started looking at numbers. And the fact is, um, Fort Bragg is a unique scenario, and their deer population has dropped off. Um, but I have um, some deer hunt clubs in that part of the state as well. And so I went and started looking at their data, and they showed some of the same trends. And we looked at things like uh, lactation rate, and we found that the number of does that were killed in, for example, the months of September and October, um, the percent of them that were still making milk, that were still lactating, was much lower than it was in other counties. So it seems that in some habitat types, in this in this example, the sand hills, that predation of coyotes, or excuse me, <clears throat> fawn predation by coyotes is much higher. And um, it makes sense when you look at the habitat type, the places that those deer have to hide their fawns, um, they're much more linear. They're in the form of sand hills drains or uh, sand hill seeps, um, but the, the, the watersheds. And so a coyote could just cruise those um, and his, the area that he's hunting is much smaller, and so his success rate could be much higher. Um, but they eat lots of, th lots of animals, and, um, you know, we're talking a little bit about urban spaces, and coyotes do wonderful in urban areas. And I think one of the eco-services that they probably provide in urban areas are on rodent populations. And so coyotes, I believe, I can't prove this with data, but um, I believe that if you look at habitat types that are rich in rodents and rabbits, um, small animals that are easy to capture and that are low risk, that those animals are more likely to show up in coyote diets than deer, which are much more risky, in particular once they're older than about 12 weeks old and they can kick the animal, hurt the animal. It's a much riskier endeavor. Um, I put red fox on here. 
one of the um, assumed interactions was that as coyotes, um, as they became more, uh, or as they increased in occupation, that they would displace red foxes. Uh, but I'll just, I'll just tell you, I've not seen that to be the case. That doesn't seem to be the case in our trapping data. Um, trail camera data would indicate that they have overlap and that they share ranges. Certainly they're not friends and they don't get along. And I'm not saying that they don't kill red foxes, but red foxes are still hanging on and doing quite well. I think one relationship that's worth mentioning is the relationship between um, mesopredators um, and coyotes. So this would refer to things like raccoons, skunks, possums. And the reason that these are important is because these are also fur bearers. These are animals that at one time would have been uh, commonly trapped for their furs. And again, this is something that is uh, largely fallen out of practice. And so their, their populations have gone unchecked. In fact, if I had to guess, I would say that raccoon populations are right now at an all-time high. And one of the saving graces that we might have are coyotes. Um, I'm not going to tell you that a raccoon is a favorite, a favorite prey item of a coyote. I don't believe that to be the case, but uh, they do show up in diet studies, and so we do know that they do prey upon it. And this is probably helpful for all the things that raccoons prey upon, in particular ground nesting birds, including those that um, will have shown notable declines in recent years, things like the bobwhite and the wild turkey. Now, when we start talking about human perception, um, well, I'm just going to be honest with you. Uh, people think all sorts of things. They're varied. And the number one thing that you'll hear is it's usually just related to fear. And uh, I can remember being a kid and I had a teacher that used to say, take a chill pill. And if there really was one, um, man, she would have been a billionaire because a lot of people need it. Um, and, and I say that kind of tongue in cheek, but I, I've had people call that were scared of, of rabbits and deer and a coyote at least looks like an animal that could be dangerous. It has sharp teeth and it looks like a tiny wolf. Um, having said that, human safety is not really an issue. Again, that doesn't mean that fear is not an issue. Uh, that I realize that they make people uncomfortable, but the fact is they're just really not dangerous animals. Um, now, when we start talking about pets um, in urban spaces, you're getting into some different territory. Uh, attacks on dogs are uh, they're quite uncommon, but they do happen. If you live in the Charlotte area, you've probably seen um, you've seen this in the news a time or two because it does happen. Most of the time, the dog is an exceptionally small breed, and coyotes don't really look at them as dogs so much as a prey item. And in particular, I'm, I'm talking about little toy breeds, little five-pound and smaller. Um, but every once in a while, there is an incident with a larger dog. And I think most of the time those have to do with proximity to young, in particular, a coyote that has a den and she will defend that den even against very large dogs. Um, certainly there are agricultural situations where coyotes, um, mostly it's sheep and goats that they will sometimes prey upon, but I think a lot of times they're getting blame uh, for things that they don't really deserve. Um, We'll talk a little bit more. Um, <laughs> I'll, I'll, let, I'll let you read that. I'm not going to read that. There's a lot of text on the slide. I, I apologize for that. But, you know, basically that says that people have all sorts of opinions. And um, as you heard earlier, there are a lot of people that really dislike coyotes. Um, and in many times hunters have that feeling. And so do folks that live um well, in HOAs, where they see them regularly, they just don't like them being there because they're there without their permission. And it feels a little bit like something slinking around in the backyard. I'm not going to show this. Um, this is a little YouTube video. And uh, this, um, this was a coyote in Huntersville. And it's several years old now. And I'm sure many of you have seen it. And it's pretty eerie. But this is an example of a coyote that is displaying behavior that is threatening to people. In fact, in this YouTube video, if you want to go look this up on your own time, um, this coyote actually bites the vehicle. Um, and so this particular coyote, I believe, was captured. Oh, I'm playing it anyway. It, um, it, it did have rabies. Um, but as far as 
what are the chances of being bitten by a coyote? Um, it's next to none. Uh, there's around 10 attacks per year. Um, I could only find records of two fatalities. There may be more, but that was all I could come up with. Um, and I know that in my time as a wildlife biologist, we have had four attacks. And I suspect all four of them were rabid animals. So we'll call those unique circumstances. Um, in, particular, uh, in particular, unique when you consider how rare rabies and coyotes is. It's extraordinarily rare. Um, when you look at all cases of rabies, you'll see that they fit into their own category of other. And they're put in there with things like cows and bobcats and horses. Um, the vast majority of rabies cases that's seen in wildlife are in raccoons, skunks, and foxes. Um, I mentioned fear. I, I want to I have to say a little something here. We have um, some folks that work in the Raleigh office, and um, they work with what's called the Wildlife Helpline. And if you ever have a wildlife issue, then you can call that number. Um, and those folks are specifically trained uh, to talk folks through wildlife issues. But let me say that seeing a coyote is not, we do not consider that a wildlife issue. Uh, it's just an observation of what is now a common wildlife in North Carolina. Um, but these folks, a big part of their job is educating North Carolina's public. And many, perhaps most, wildlife problems are actually people problems. And I'm not blaming anybody. Um, in fact, many of the things that we tell people not to do, I grew up doing. Feeding animals outside and leaving ex excess pet food out there to be cleaned up by wildlife. Um, Putting out bird feeders. I'm not an. I'm not against feeding birds. But you just need to realize that um, birds are messy. They spill bird seed, and critters come and clean up after it. Some of those critters will be things like mice and rats, and that may attract coyotes. Um, sometimes pet foods are not stored very well. Animals can get into them. Um, sometimes it's garbage or it's scraps that are thrown out. And the more that a coyote comes to visit. Well, we'll say a spot where somebody throws out chicken bones, then the more times they come into close contact with people, the more they get used to them. Um, and I put a little note here about cats. I meant to mention uh, cats in a separate slide. And as far as I can tell, um, domestic cats, feral cats, house cats that are allowed to come and go, um, just domestic cats in general, they seem to be a favorite food of coyotes. Um, in fact, you can get on YouTube and you can watch like a uh, ring video camera of them hunting cats. It's not real pretty. I'm not necessarily recommending it, um, but they look like a risky animal to catch. Even still, coyotes seem to go out of their way to seek out cats. And I have spoken to two different folks that supported feral cat colonies, which by the way, is a terrible practice. It's not recommended. Um, but they would go and feed like 35 cats. They just dump out a bag of cat food. And if you think about this from a coyote's perspective, he comes and hunts cats. Even if he's unsuccessful, he eats cat food. And so he's going to keep coming back. And, and in both of these scenarios, the coyotes actually got every single cat. Um, I got real curious about it and I dug into the research and I found that um, there was at least one paper. I think it was from a study that was done in Chicago. And they observed, I think in this particular study, it was like 16 interactions between cats and coyotes. And in all 16 of those, the coyote got the cat. So um, I know a lot of people love cats and, they, and cats like to be outside and they let them come and go. Just realize the risk that you take if you, if you go that route. Um, regarding, urban, regarding urban areas, um, in fact, these... Uh, two pictures that you see on your screen, they are green spaces, and you see those X's. Those are actually GPS points from the coyote that struck out, went north from Fort Bragg into Virginia, and I believe this is in uh, Greensboro. And um, you'll notice that she just found some uh, green spaces where she could um, stop and hang out a while. In fact, if you go back and look at that slide, you'll see the spot where she stopped. And um, in fact, 
the slide on the left, you'll see that that particular, um, I realize that there's a cleared lot there, but the vegetation around it is probably perfect coyote habitat. They like cover. Um, in fact, if you want to predict what habitats coyotes will use, it's generally going to be dense cover. Of course, it has more of the prey items that they're interested in, rodents, rabbits, um, the kind of place where a deer would put its fawn or would, would give birth to its fawn. Um, and coyotes do exceptionally well in those early successional type areas. Um, so when you think about coyotes in Charlotte, um, yeah, sometimes people send me uh, cell camera or uh, uh, cell phone videos of them walking down the sidewalk. But for the most part, they're traveling greenways and green spaces. And these are mostly drainage areas, they're right of ways and that sort of thing. But um, coyotes do wonderful in urban areas. Uh, in fact, I wouldn't be surprised if there's not just as many coyotes in Mecklenburg County as some of the more rural surrounding counties. Um, again, this is another trail camera photo of uh, the coyote that had the litter under the little outbuilding near the Mallard Creek area. And <clears throat> I can't remember now. I think she had, I see four pups in this picture. I think she had five. And in this particular case, she ended up moving those pups and she only moved them, she moved them um, below someone else's outbuilding, two or three houses down. And um, those pups got sick and died. And so that entire litter was lost. And um, it's summertime. They went pretty quick. Uh, there's no testing done, but you know, it could have been distemper or parvovirus or something like that. There's all sorts of diseases that, um, coyotes can get. Um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on rural interactions, but I will say when you start thinking about coyotes as a nuisance, this is a more real situation. If you're raising, um, in particular, small livestock for profit, uh, having said that, there are practices that can be put into place to reduce losses. And when I say reduce losses, greatly reduce losses um, just by having birthing pens, guardian dogs, um, or in the case of cattle, um, I come from cattlemen. My father had cattle my entire life as I grew up with cattle, my grandfather. And in, in all the time that they both had cattle, I only know of two calves ever lost. And both times the cow gave birth on a slope, and the calf slid under a fence where the cow could not get to it. Um, when we start in my career, I have gone out to look at sheep and goat uh, depredation issues. And a lot of times it's hard to tell exactly what did it just by looking at the carcass. Uh, but there's a guy that works for wildlife services. His name's Todd Minky. And um, I would say Todd Minky is probably a leading expert in wildlife damage. i um, done it his entire career. He's also a trapper. And I, I remember at one of his seminars, he said that, much of the time, it is a dog that's causing the damage. It's coyotes getting the blame. I think he said 90% of the time. And he said, and 90% of that time, it's the dog that lives on that farm. And interestingly, I have found that to be the case. Now, the farmer doesn't want to hear that. Um, but I think dogs are guilty um, far more often of livestock damage than coyotes. Not to say that it doesn't happen. Um, it, it definitely happens. Um, but I think dogs are a bigger issue than coyotes. Um, <clears throat> when when we talk about management, um, I think that the most popular option is the first option. It's it's to do nothing. Um, now I don't tell the farmer that that's that is dealing with losses. Uh, but I think for most situations, and again, I, I would like you just to remember those uh, those maps that showed dispersal. And so if you start removing coyotes, you don't, you don't have to be able to tell the future. You don't need a crystal ball to know there's going to be more coyotes. They're going to drop in and take the place of the one that you've removed. So if you take it upon yourself to do lethal options, and um, there's basically once a year round day or night hunting season on coyotes in North Carolina. We have long liberal trapping seasons in areas where that's appropriate, certainly not in urban areas for the most part. There may be special circumstances or special individuals. Uh, that is coyotes that are especially problematic, though that's not the norm. Um, depredation permits can be had by uh, folks that are experiencing some type of damage. Um, but for the most part, 
coyotes, even even where there's good numbers of them, and you hear them often. I we hear them often at, at my house where I live. Um, we can hear them howling shortly after sunset most evenings if we go out and listen. And we don't have any problems. They're here. Um, they're well established. There are many of them, um, but they're not problematic. And you know, we have dogs. We have um, chickens, and we've never had an issue. We've even had them in our yard. Never an issue. So most people can do absolutely nothing. Um, in situations where uh, they're they're more habituated and they're coming closer, um, there are things that you can do. The number one thing is make sure you're not doing anything to attract them, to encourage them to come there. And it's generally um, leaving something out that, that is good for them to eat. Now, there are times where that's harder work. If you have an apple tree and it's dropping apples, coyotes love apples. Um, in fact, I, uh, I ran a trail camera this year in uh, Moore County on a persimmon tree. And I, I think I got more pictures of coyotes eating persimmons than I did of deer. Um, so they do like uh, fruits. And uh, and if you've got an apple tree, you're going to probably have coyotes. And I realized that picking up all the apples is almost impossible. Um, but you can do, you can hang up flag and tape. You can use a flashing light, motion activated uh, devices, whether sprinklers, radios, etc. cetera. Um, and you can generally manage the negative interactions with coyotes. Um, this is a, a very common uh, chart. This is used uh, basically to show that even if you do hunt them, um, when you remove, well, let's say that you do remove 70%, which is what's required to, to have some sort of noticeable impact. When you do that, the remaining coyotes will respond because their, their fitness is higher. There's more resources per individual, so they're healthier, and they generally respond with higher reproduction. They will have more uh, pups per litter. And so uh, you can go this route, but you'll have, it's almost impossible to have any kind of lasting effect. In fact, it, it will require annual removal. And so only in situations where you really need um, to be removing individual coyotes that are problematic do I think that the lethal options work. In fact, you can look at the history of the Western uh, states and the efforts that um, were government endorsed um, and that were even done by the government to remove coyotes. And there are just as many today as there were before um, trapping programs, shooting programs, helicopters, dogs, poisons, all that stuff. The point is they are so resilient, it's almost impossible to remove them from an area. Um, there's some, some links here. Um, on this page, but basically, in fact, uh, our website is undergoing some changes. Some of these specific links might not even uh, be live right now, but let me just say that Google's your friend. Uh, there are a lot of resources on the North Carolina Wildlife Resources website. Um, they're very good, and and I didn't write them. Um, mostly, my coworkers wrote them, uh, but there's a, a plethora of information there, not just on coyotes, but on all sorts of wildlife. And so I just wanted to point your attention to that. Um, and with that, I will say, coyotes are here. They're not going anywhere. Um, they're really not, they really don't cause, in my opinion, much in the way of negative effects. And I'm, and I'm an avid deer hunter. And I realize that they do in some of the, some parts of my uh, district, they do exhibit high predation rates on fawns. Um, but I think they have sort of fallen in. We could, I, I would almost go so far as to say that we could accept them as a smaller, more tolerable replacement to the larger predators that were here before they were removed.